Hey, what's up everyone? How's it going? This is Waj. And for the longest time now, I've been trying to upgrade my existing computer. It's getting kind of slow and a little bit outdated these days, and I really want to make something special. So this is a step-by-step -step guide on how to build the ultimate gaming and productivity machine. So this is specifically geared towards first-time PC builders, as well as some people that might have made a computer in the past and are kind of wanting to upgrade to the latest generation of a computer components. So this is a perfect video for all you guys. And what I've done is separated this guide into several different segments. So you can go ahead and skip to a specific part of the video if you so desire. But if you're interested in watching me build my computer from start to finish, sit back, relax, and I'll show you how to make your dream machine a reality. Now before you buy in your components or actually start building your computer, you're gonna to wanna to ask yourself three essential questions. Number one is what is the primary use of this computer? Number two is going to be how long do you plan on keeping this thing running for? So do you want something that meets your bare minimum essential needs for now? Or do you want something that can be upgraded in the future to meet your ever growing and demanding needs for a longer time frame? And number three is going to be your budget, which is gonna be a good driving force on determining what kind of parts you can afford and uh, what kind of computer you're overall gonna build. Now for me personally, this computer is going to be tasked to do a lot of different things. Specifically, I really wanna play ultra high definition games on my 4K monitor, as well as play some games on my triple 1080p monitor setup. So it's definitely gonna have to have uh, some pretty serious graphics to power those really high resolution display configurations. Additionally, it's gonna be used for a lot of multimedia work, specifically photo and video editing, as well as motion graphics, and I do a lot of music production from time to time as well. So I'm gonna need definitely a lot of RAM and as many cores as I can afford. Now the basis of our build is going to be the latest generation Haswell E chip from Intel. We're specifically using the Core i7-5820K. This is an unlocked CPU that has a six physical cores with hyper-threading enabled. So uh, in the OS, you're gonna view it as 12 cores, which is definitely gonna be good for some of my productivity stuff. Additionally, this is, this is an unlocked CPU. I can do a lot of overclocking and get the most out of this pretty budget-oriented six-core CPU. Now for the CPU core, Cooler, we're gonna go with the Corsair H105. This is an all-in-one water cooling solution from Corsair with a dual 120 millimeter radiator configuration. And with this cooler, we shouldn't have any problems with overclocking our stock CPU from 3.3 all the way up to a four gigahertz and beyond. Now for our motherboard, we're gonna be using the MSI X99S SLI Plus. Now compared to other X99 motherboards, this is a pretty affordable board uh, which comes with all of the features that you would expect from this architecture, including quad-channel DDR4 memory, which is the latest and greatest in terms of RAM technology. We also do have built-in support for Gen 3 M.2 solid-state memory, as well as uh, 10 USB 3.0 connections. Plus, if I want to make an epic balls-to-the-walls gaming machine, this has four expansion slots for quad GPU configuration. Now, DDR4 memory does not come in a cheap price tag right now, and in fact, the ADATA XPG Z1 memory that I've selected is clocked at about 2133 megahertz, which is pretty much the same as a higher end DDR3 memory. And uh, for me, I don't really need speed, I need volume. So I have 64 gigs of a DDR4, which is certainly completely overkill for gaming, but uh, since I'm gonna be doing a lot of raw 4K video editing, as well as a lot of motion graphics and photo editing at super high resolutions, I need Need all the RAM that I can get and with 64 gigs of DDR4 hopefully I won't have to complain about not having enough RAM on my computer. Now for the power supply I'm using the XFX XTR 750 watt fully modular power supply. This is a great PSU with 80 plus gold efficiency so it should have no problems powering all of our higher end components. Now SSDs have came down quite a bit in the past couple of years and uh, I'm going to take advantage of the price point right now and I, I'm a huge fan of the Samsung SSD drives. I really love the Samsung Evo 840 so I'm going to get four 250 gig SSDs and I'm going to put them in RAID uh, 10 configuration so I have uh, both redundancy and speed. Additionally I'm going to be using a five terabyte mechanical hard drive for all of our long-term storage needs.
Now the GPU that I'm using is probably one of the fastest single GPUs that is available in the market and that's specifically the EVGA GTX 980. I'm using the super clocked edition of the card which is using the ACX 2.0 cooler and plus with 4 gigs of video memory we shouldn't have any real issues in uh, playing games in ultra high definition. The case that we've selected is the Fractal Design Define R4. This is probably one of the most popular PC case that is available right now and for good reason. It has lots of foam padding for added sound dampening as well as a sleek and minimalistic design that has a lot of versatility in order for you to make a powerful yet quiet PC. Before you begin, you want to make sure that you find yourself a safe, static-free workspace and you want to make sure that you're free from any static discharge. You can do this by get using an electrostatic wrist strap or by touching a metal part of a computer case that's connected to the wall outlet. Now, as you can see over here, I am wearing gloves primarily to avoid getting any grease or fingerprints onto my components, but you don't really have to wear gloves if you don't want to. Now, the main primary tool you're going to need to build your own computer is just a simple Phillips head screwdriver. I like to use one with a magnetic tip to make smaller screws easier to work with. Everything else you see over here is optional. I do like to always keep a pair of side cutters and a pair of needle nose pliers that comes in handy from time to time. Additionally, it's always nice to have a small container to keep all your screws in one place. Now, building a PC is really just a one person job, but it doesn't hurt to have some company from time to time. Now the first thing that we're going to do is take the motherboard box and put the motherboard on top of it. And this is going to create a good non-conductive build platform for us. Now step one, we're going to install our CPU. We're going to start by holding the CPU by its edges and we're going to identify the gold triangle and match the orientation to the triangle marked on the socket cover plate. Now once you know the correct orientation for your CPU, you're going to go ahead and release both CPU retention arms. And you could do this by simply pressing down on them and moving them towards the center of the socket. And now we can open up the socket cover and orient the CPU as determined previously with the gold triangle. And you know your alignment is perfectly correct when the four notches on the CPU fit directly into the socket itself. No force is needed to actually place the CPU into the socket and you could give it a gentle wiggle to make sure it's sitting right. After that, go ahead and close the socket cover and lock both retention arms. Once you do that, the the plastic cover will automatically pop off. You can either remove it or keep it on for added protection until you install the CPU cooler. Now the RAM installation is pretty straightforward. You want to simply open the tabs to your RAM slots and then you want to align each module with the slot by matching the key on the socket of the RAM with the notch on the stick. And you want to press firmly and evenly on both sides of the stick until your RAM has gone fully into the slot. And you know if you've done it correctly once the tab locks by itself. After you get the first one in, go ahead and repeat the step for all of the other sticks of RAM. Now since we have 64 gigabytes of RAM, I'm going to populate all eight slots with eight gigabytes of RAM. And if you have four RAM sticks instead of eight, you want to make sure you're placing each module in a color coordinate fashion to make sure that your memory is in the appropriate channels. Now next we're going to prep our case. We want to remove both side covers and you want to put the screws in a safe place so we don't lose them. After that we're going to install the motherboard IO plate and you want to press Press firmly on all corners of the plate from the inside of the case until it snaps into place. Now since we're using a full ATX motherboard, we need to install nine standoff screws. You can find the standoff screws as well as a whole bunch of other screws in the box of screws that came with your case. Now sometimes it is a little bit difficult to install these standoff screws with your hand, so that's where the needle nose pliers comes in handy. After that, we can finally align the motherboard according to those nine standoff screws, and we want to go ahead and screw in each of the nine points in order to secure the motherboard to our case. And once the motherboard is in, we want to go ahead and plug in our front panel connectors. Now, if you're ever unsure of anything, I would refer you to your motherboard manual for more information. But usually your motherboard comes with a couple of front panel connectors that makes connecting everything a little bit more easier. Now here we're going to go ahead and connect our power and reset switch to the corresponding location as indicated on the connector itself. You want to do the same for your power slash 
slash hard drive activity light and go ahead and plug in those two connectors onto the motherboard itself. After that, go ahead and plug in your USB 2.0 block connector to the internal USB connection on your motherboard. Moreover, you can connect your front audio header for your headphones and microphone input to the audio connection on the motherboard. After that, you can plug in your front USB 3.0 connector to the internal USB 3 port, which in my case was right beside the SATA connections. Additionally, at this time, you can connect your case fans to a nearby case fan connection on your motherboard marked usually system fan. Or in my case, if you have a case fan controller, you can easily plug in the fans to the controller itself and manually control the speed. After that, we're going to need five SATA cables for all of our drives, and we're going to simply connect each cable to the internal SATA ports on the motherboard. Our next step is to install our power supply. We're going to start with getting all of the power cables that we're going to need to connect components such as your graphics card, motherboard, CPU, SATA drives, and Molex connectors for extra things such as case fan controllers. We're going to simply plug in all of those cables to our modular connections on our PSU and place the power supply unit into the case and we're going to screw it using the four screws that came with the power supply. After that, you can feed all of the cables to the other side of the case and plug in the power to your CPU, which is an A-pin connector located near the CPU itself. After connect the main power for your motherboard, followed by connecting our Molex connector to the power for our fan controller. Moving forward, we're going to now install our CPU cooler. Since we're using a all-in-one water cooling solution from Corsair, we typically need to install a CPU retention plate at the back of the motherboard, but luckily most modern X99 motherboards have that pre-installed. So next you want to take your four standoff screws that came with your cooler and screw them in into the CPU retention plate. Now as you can see over here, we already have thermal compound applied to our water block, so we can just simply place it onto the CPU and screw it evenly into place. After that, you can connect the water block pump to your CPU fan header that's on the motherboard. And next, before you install the radiator, you want to plug in the two fans for the radiator into the fan splitter cable that came with your cooler. You want to simply plug both of those fans in one end and connect the other end into your motherboard marked system fan. And now since all of those connections are made, we can go ahead and install our radiator to the top of the case. There are eight short individual screws that you will use to mount the radiator to your case. Now, of course, I recommend that the fans for the radiator should be set up for intake. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to use the long screws to mount each fan to the radiator. And continuing forward, we're now going to install our GPU. So what we're going to do is remove the back plates that corresponds to the PCIe slot that we're going to occupy with our GPU. So go ahead and remove the back plate for those two. And we're going to insert our GPU into the PCIe slot. It should just snap and lock into place. And lastly, you can secure the card to the case by using the two thumb screws that we just used to take off the back plates. After that, we're just going to plug in our PCI Express power connectors to the graphics card we're using two six pin connections over here now the only thing we have left to install is our drive so we're going to start by removing the individual drive bays from the case and we're going to mount each of our drives to the drive bays themselves you want to make sure you have the right orientations for your drive and once you have all your drives screwed in and you can go ahead and slide each bay back into the case after that simply connect your data SATA connections to each drive followed by the SATA power connections and our last step in terms of building our computer is going to be cable management. Now, you can choose to clean up all the loose wires in your own fashion. Just remember that twist ties are your friend. And thankfully, with this case, cable management is pretty easy and straightforward. Now, once your computer is built, you can go ahead and connect your keyboard, mouse, monitor, and your main power, turn on the computer, and uh, basically see if everything is working right. If it posts, uh, you're good to go. You can see right over here that in the BIOS, everything is being recognized, all of our RAM and our processor. And if you're just installing Windows normally, you can go ahead and insert your USB thumb drive that contains your operating system. Press F11 as your computer boots up and choose to boot into the USB thumb drive. And it's as simple as that. You can install Windows as you normally would. But what we're going to be doing is uh, configuring a RAID configuration. So if you're interested in uh, setting up RAID, uh, this is the process that we're going to take. Now to set up our RAID configuration, we're going to first turn on our PC and we're going to go ahead and press delete to enter 
enter into the BIOS. Once we're in the BIOS, we're going to go to settings and then hit advanced, go into integrated peripherals and under the SATA configuration table, you want to select SATA mode and you want to make sure that you choose RAID mode, which is basically going to allow the RAID to be enabled on your computer and we can make our RAID volume. So you, what we're going to do is press F10 to save and restart your computer. And when your computer is restarting, you're going to see the Intel Rapid Technologies screen and you want to right away press Control I to get into the RAID configuration menu. And as you can see over here, we have all four SSDs being displayed, which is good. And we want to select the option number one to create our new RAID volume. And here we can name our RAID volume. I'm just going to call it RAID just to be simple. And you want to hit tab to get into the next setting, which is RAID level or RAID type. And you can scroll through the different types of RAID by using the up, down arrow keys. We're going to go with RAID 10 because that's uh, probably the best option for me right now, which is a combination of RAID 1 and 0. We're going to go ahead and hit tab on that. And we're going to change our stripe size to 64 kilobytes and uh, hit tab again. Capacity is going to be automatically set based on our drives and our RAID configuration. So you don't really need to worry about that. And then we're just going to hit enter to create our new RAID volume. And it's going to ask us to confirm. We're going to hit Y there. And that's it. We have a, now a RAID 10 setup. You can now go ahead and press escape and Y to get out of the RAID menu. And it's going to restart our computer. And we're going to press F11 to get into the uh, boot drive selector menu. And uh, we're going to choose the USB thumb drive that has our uh, operating system installer in it. So uh, we're just going to select that. I have a Windows 8.1 installer in here. And once we get into the Windows 8.1 installer, we're going to select the custom option and uh, choose our newly created RAID volume. And you can identify the RAID volume based on the size of the disk itself. So we're going to go ahead and hit a next and confirm. And uh, we're going to install our Windows 8.1 onto our RAID. And it only took me about three to four minutes, believe it or not, to install the whole entire operating system pretty blazingly fast. And once we're in to the OS uh, and you get to the desktop, we're going to now just simply install all of our drivers that we need. And you're pretty much done. Now, last and finally, if you're interested in seeing how this computer does in terms of different performance tests and how it actually performs in real life, you definitely want to check out the video that I just made where I put the computer through its paces. We did a lot of 4K benchmarking as well as some other resolutions in terms of gaming. And we tested out the CPU, RAM configuration, and uh, pretty much everything that I'm going to be using this computer for. So definitely check out that video if you're interested. But other than that, thank you so much for watching this tutorial. I really do appreciate a lot of your support and hopefully this video helped you out in some way. If you like this content, make sure to check back to our channel every now and then and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have any questions about anything, please make sure to leave that on a comment down below. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you later. Take care.